Hello and welcome back to The Last Word on Spurs. We are your award-winning Tottenham Hotspur podcast. We've had a little bit of a breather, as you know, over the last five, six, seven days to really regain our thoughts and look ahead to what is the business stage of the season upon us. I think it's fair to say that um, I think the last couple of weeks have been, to some degree, a little bit testing. And now, again, as we are an emotive channel, one that are very, very close to the club and, of course, a dear, dear care for Tottenham Hotspur Football Club that um, obviously these shows are really upbeat when we win. Obviously, when we lose, we try and take it apart. We try and understand why and how things have gone wrong. And that's why we're delighted to welcome back a returning guest that's going to most certainly give us some insight from his perspective of studying Ange over the course of many, many years in terms of what we should expect in the business stage of this interco. to come. Before we bring in the guest to the show, I'm delighted to have back alongside me, our instructor, conductor, the runner, Lee McQueen is in the house. Maka, how are you, my man? You okay? I'm good, man. I'm good, yeah. It's been a while, mate. So I've, I've had nearly mm. two weeks off. I'm getting withdrawal symptoms. But unfortunately <laughs> for all the viewers and listeners, you've now got me back to back to back to back, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm on a few of the shows now. and delighted to uh, to have our uh, our esteemed guest with us as well. It was a fantastic read, uh, The Revolution. And, and ultimately, we want to get down to business uh talking uh to john about the man the methods and the mastery that is Ange Ball. and i'm very excited because there's a few murmurings isn't there there's a few murmurings mm. now of people oh, is Ange Ball the right thing is it, is it working you know that sort of stuff so we've got we could bring on the main man to talk to us about Ange Ball and uh what we can expect for the rest of the season loving it absolutely look again we had this man join us i want to say when spurs were unbeaten in the Premier League. Things were flying high. Everyone was avidly reading the book, and I'm sure they still are now, And because it was a masterpiece from John. I know many really bought into the fact of just what the man was doing at Tottenham, transforming us. There may be that argument, we'll come on to that point with John, that maybe was the start of the season, when you look back in hindsight now, slightly, slightly clouded by the fact of the way Spurs had the fixtures fall their way. Obviously, we've had a lot of injuries since then, international absences, but we are now, as I mentioned, in the business stage of the season. It feels great to bring this man back to give us an insight of what could be coming in the final remaining 13, 14, 15 games. I'd like to welcome back the author, of course, of that book Lee refers to there. Special guest, John Grecian, is back. John, love to have you on last one, Spurs. How are oh, you? It's brilliant to be back, guys. Absolutely brilliant to be back. I've been watching with fascination, not just <laughs> the football, but the reactions to how the football's gone. Well, you know what, John, it's interesting. You know, when we think and we look back to the time that we had you on here, and obviously that was a great, great opportunity to bring you on to obviously get some insight into the book, which I know many now have purchased because of the fact of that love for Ange Ball and the way, obviously, that book has been constructed and written. That essentially, I know at the moment as we stand, we go into, as I keep on referring to the fact that um, we are in the final concourse to some degree of the season where really Spurs do need to really accumulate as many points as possible to, of course, hopefully finish in that top four, top five, depending on the coefficient. And I think it's an interesting time because, again, there has been, as Lee referred to there, just a few murmurings that um, there's been some questions over the system, the style, the tactics. I think many buy into the fact that, look, it is a long-term project. It's not going to be an overnight success. So, I mean, before we go into all that, I mean, John, what have you made since our last conversation of where things are at with Spurs going into as we said now, this final, I'd say, conclusion of the season where we've got a couple of months really now to hopefully Spurs accumulate those points and finish in those European places. Well, I think they're going through now what he usually goes through at the start with a club. So quite often when Ange takes over, he's had it at Brisbane, South Melbourne, Celtic in particular, where, you know, he'll have a real struggle at the start and he loves that period. He usually loves it because he knows what's coming. So he can see all the work that's going on behind the scenes. He knows they're just about to break out. Everyone else there is doubting him, looking at it, going, oh, this is rubbish. What does he know? And then he clicks something like Brisbane, where they go on that ridiculous winning run. South Melbourne, they get a scrappy goal away from home, and he ends up you know, right at the start of his career. Whether a, a scrappy goal away from home, his career might have been ended there. You know, at Celtic, there was a game up at Aberdeen. I wrote about it in the book. We kind of interspersed the book with key games. He won up at Aberdeen and you could see the way he kept his team playing. And like, it's not how you or I would set a team up. 
try to chase a game late on. Or even, if you remember, Pep used to put big uh, you know, PK up front sometimes. You know, it's not like us would do it. He just kept playing away, kept playing away, kept playing away. Eventually, the ball falls to Callum McGregor, and it's a goal. And that's how he did it. And it was like playing his football, that's the way he does things. So now he's going through that stage. So it's like later in the season, because we talked about it, it was probably a slightly easier start in terms of the the uh, fixture list. He's going through that phase now. He's definitely just forget about the idea that he's going to change. Just, just we'll get that out there right now. No chance. Whole lot of reasons why. Love it. Love it. Can, can I just uh, ask on that point? I think that we just rewind a little bit. You know, I, I know we have, this is the second time that you've been on uh, with us, John, which is brilliant. Uh, but just rewind a little bit. You know, we're up to the up to the Chelsea game, played 10 games, we've won eight, drawn two, lost zero, top the league. We played Chelsea. Everyone knows what happened in that Chelsea game. I was there in the stadium that day. We went down to nine men. We lost we lost Mickey van der Ven to a horrendous hamstring industry in, in, uh, in injury, sorry. Uh we lost um James Madden to an ankle injury, right? Both of them were out for three months. But in that game, we were completely decimated. And he still played. High line on the defence. I mean, uh, Vicario was absolutely outstanding sweeper keeping. And it was just, a, it, I, we obviously lost the game 4-1. Everyone knows that. But what most people may not know is, and I was there in the stadium, we gave the players a stand innovation off that pitch. It was, it was a weird, it was such a togetherness moment, John. It was just unbelievable. Was, I've never experienced something like that before. It was just like, you know what? We know, we know. Thank you to the players. Thank you to Big Ange. We know this is Ange ball. We love it. And since that day, and, and since the players have started to come back, and since we got beaten by Man City in the Cup, it's just felt a little bit like it's not like that anymore. Just see where I'm coming from. And I'm trying to, what I'm trying to understand is like in your experience, John, obviously with the book. And uh, you know how much you know of Ange and followed his career, and yet slightly different from the a, a tough start to kind of you know now he knows what's coming. Is can can we not recover from this? But is this normal? Like in the process, should we be worried? Because we've now got our back four back. I know they weren't playing the last game, but we've got our back four all fit. Our, our goalkeeper, our first choice goalkeeper is fit. Madison's fit. Sonny's back. Basuma's back. Bentecourt's back. I mean, th- we're, we're kind of running out of excuses of why we're not playing full bottle and ball. And it's just, I just wanted to see, did, and he's gone through periods like that before. See where I'm coming from? Yeah, he's he's, you know, he's had a lot of issues during his career, if you look back at it. Um, he, he understands more than anyone that football is not an exact science. Football management is like alchemy, trying to spin, spin gold out of straw, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. I, ju- I think there are two. Okay, there are two sides to why he's going to stick with what he sticks with. There's a psychological, and there's a pragmatic. Okay, the psychological is is really simple. So, say he goes more pragmatic and plays safe for a few games, like that grinding out a few results. Okay, he does that. Then he wants to revert to type, and they go out in a game when they're two 0 up, cruising. They lose a goal. And he wants players to keep playing. No, no, go make it 3-4. What do you think the players are going to do? They're going to go back into their shells. They're not going to carry him because he's already given them permission. He's given yeah, them permission, permission to go back and go, oh, we'll just play safe and we'll sit on 2-1. And guess what? You lose it anyway. You know. So he loses them. He loses what he's trying to get them to play. The other reason is pragmatic. So there you go. Say he goes pragmatic for the, or goes safe for the rest of the season and grinds out results and finishes fifth and you sneak into the Champions League. And then next year you finish sixth because you can't ever recover that magic again. He's having to just play a kind of a, a hybrid between what he really wants and what the league demands and what all this. Finish mm-hmm. sixth next year and you don't make the Champions League. And the football's a bit shit. What are the fans going to be like? The fans would be like, well, yeah. this isn't what it was, you know, this isn't what it was stacked up to be. Whereas he would rather, he's, there's a phrase that gets used by one of his old coaches and assistants says he never wants to just beat the better team. He wants to be the better team. Okay. So he'll finish. If he's building towards what he wants to build to finish seventh this year, challenge for the title next year, win the title the year after. That's the world he's living in. That's this headspace he lives in. He's not in there to finish fourth. And I think he said it a few times, I'm not playing for fourth, mate. 
He's not playing for fourth yeah. place. He wants to win a league. You know, he want to win the Champions League. He believes he can be the best coach in the world. He believes he's at a club and a team capable of winning, even against Man City's billions and whatever else is being built out there. So you take the short-term pain in order to build for it next year. So next year, he'd be looking for a title challenge. I think, And that's, what, what, that's I think why he won't just, change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, just to follow up on that, and again, just getting some understanding from, you know, his, his last managerial appointment, obviously, in Celtic as well. And Celt Celtic were like absolute juggernauts, right? You know, when they're 1-1, one, one, they're 1-1. One, one, they can go 14, 15, 16 game winning streaks, you know, or, or, or you know, 20 game without being unbeaten or whatever. And I think you can take that. I'm one of these people that think you can take that into the Premier League, Premier League regardless. Like, I think you can take that as a momentum thing. But I think one of the things that's that's quite rearing its not ugly head, but rearing its head a little bit around a stadium and certainly on social media and stuff is that when we when we lost to Villa at home, we were magnificent. And everybody came away from that, you know, when we lost to Chelsea, we were magnificent. And everyone came away from that going, well, you know, with that nine men, we were amazing, stand ovation. When we lost to Villa, we were magnificent. And, you know, we're always going to give away chances or goals in, in, in this system. And I don't think anyone was worried about that too much. When we're at the other end, we, I think we had nine shots on target against Villa. We were magnificent. We should have, we should have scored at least four or five. When we beat Luton 1-0 in that first 10 games um, when Basuma got sent off. But I think we had something like seven shots on target within the first 15 minutes of the game. We were absolutely unbelievable. We should have been like 6-0, li literally 6-0 at half-time. Um, the following game after Villa, to West Ham, we were absolutely brilliant and we battered them and we should have won the game. And I don't... I don't get angry per se. We're not, when we're coming away from the stadium, guys and, and viewers and listeners, and we've absolutely pounded them, and we've we, we've lost. Yes, it's frustrating, and yes, it's disappointing. Yes, you don't get the three points, but you can see something's happening. Do you see what I mean? Because you're literally ruining teams. Like you know, you keep playing like that, you're going to go and bash someone up six seven nil. And that's what I was trying to understand. What like with with Celtic, did he go through? I don't know. Play. You know, we talked about Hearts, but you know, maybe Hibernian or something like that. Um, you know, or, you know, away and, and struggle to a one nil win, and people start going, "Oh, you know, this this won't break." But then the next week, you go and smash a team six nil because we haven't seen a five nil or six nil thrashing yet. I think we've played Newcastle, beaten four one. Um, I think that was a good performance. Good performance two nil Fulham, maybe at home, and then maybe Burnley away. Other than that, you know, from a result perspective and performance, they just. They haven't clicked, have they, Rick? You see, I'm comfortable. You're on mute, Rick, but you're on mute, you're on mute, Rick. But do you know what I mean? Like, sorry to waffle on. I'm just trying to really get the insight of kind of the essence of where the fan base is at the moment, you know? I think they've all been lead to your point there, apart from those few you've mentioned. They've all been fairly close encounters to some degree. I mean, it would be nice, I think, as James Madison mentioned in one of the uh, post match games, that would be nice of a 3 4 0 lead and be fairly relaxed and calm. But we've not really had that opportunity at home and let alone away. You know, I think, again, it kind of brings into that point that we mentioned at the start, John, is that, you know, we look at the first 10 games and that we were really in that kind of angible bubble of that real extreme excitement. But then when you look closer at the stats, I think Spurs, they played six out of the bottom 10 at present as it stands in the Premier League. You know, in hindsight, did we, John? get a little carried away because you mentioned at the start of the show for you that what we're seeing now is maybe what we should expect to see at the start of the season. Yeah, but you wouldn't be football fans if you didn't get carried away, mate. That's, that goes for the description. <laughs> can I say, can I say, <laughs> can I just say, okay, you've you got to understand, okay, so it's the Premier League, guys, right? It's the Premier League, so even the crap teams have got a couple of worldies in there. They've either got a guy who can run the 100 metres in 9.8 seconds or they've got an absolute boss in midfield who can spray past his left, right, centre. So in terms of the golf, so yeah, like the winning runs and the big scores in Scotland, with all due respect, if you're Celtic and you can't beat Ross County 5-0 at home, then there's a problem, OK? I mean, the golf is just ginormous, as big as Celtic going to the Santiago. I go burn about and playing Real Madrid. The golf is as big, yeah. without a doubt, within this domestic league. He took the same approach for both games, okay, and went into burn about and actually took Real Madrid on at their own game. Ended up losing, but got lots of plaudits for it. Stop us if you've heard that one before. Um, so, yeah, the Premier League's just so bloody hard, and and I I get I know 
this whole uh, every stage of his career, you know, uh, he's only done it at South Melbourne, and then it was he's, he's he's only done it in Australia. Well, he's only done it in Japan. He's only done it in Scotland. I I get that when you come at the Premier League, the Premier League is the toughest league in the world, almost certainly. It's the most competitive league in the world. Excellent coaches every week, excellent opponents every week. So you you can't you have to at least hold open the possibility that maybe he might not be as dominant as he was because. Yeah. You know, it's a tougher league. It, you, you, and and there will be people out there saying, I he's he's found his level. He's not going to be. He's not going to win the league with Spurs. Well, he'll believe he can. Um, that's why we play the games to find out whether he can or not. You know, he's also never worked with this, with the exception of maybe one or two. I'm thinking Callum McGregor at Celtic, who could probably walk in a Premier League team. Kyogo, although Brendan Rodgers is doing his best at the moment to disprove that. <laughs> Kyogo Furuhashi could play. <laughs> I, I listen. I remember in, in Kyogo's first season, I'd, a couple of scouts were up, Premier League scouts, and they were like, "Yeah, we've told our boss, pay twenty five million for him now. Just buy him now before he gets too big. You could probably get him for ten now." <laughs> but you know, really? the, he's not worked. He's not worked with this quality of player before either. He's really not had this. Certainly not in in a group. So, yeah, it's gonna. Uh, it's interesting. I don't expect four or five nils. Don't know. Maybe they'll happen. Maybe they'll happen. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if it actually happened. Jeez, knowing him against Liverpool, you know, I was yeah, going to say Man United, but yeah. then everybody batters Man United at some point. So, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, like, it wouldn't surprise me if you didn't. Like, yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if something just, you know, something spectacular happens, um, you know, in, in that kind of situation where he beats one of the top oh, teams 5 0 as opposed to one of the bottom teams. Yeah, that, that's interesting you said that, actually, because. Um, uh, Darrell Bradford just put up on the screen beforehand about we've only lost to uh, uh, once to a top seven team this season, and actually we've been away from home and got a draw at Emirates, got a draw at the, um, the Etihad. Um, obviously beat Liverpool at home already this season, beat Manchester United at home this season already. Da, 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 da. So actually, that, that rings true of what you're saying is that you know actually when on the big occasions, you know m- maybe we do turn up. I mean, I don't know. I just feel that. That we, I don't think we've had a 96, 97 minute game where we've played full Ange ball from start to finish. And I don't, I'm not having a good, by the way, I just want to put this out there to, to John, to you, obviously, Rick, to all of you as listeners. I absolutely love Ange, absolutely loving Ange ball. I'm absolutely loving, I'm not one of these negatives it's got change. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just trying to bring in the whole, the whole view of it's a mm. frustration to lose to Wolves because. We played Wolves twice this season, lost both games. Both games, we did not play Ange ball. I can, did not see it with my own eyeballs, both games. And, that, you know, and sometimes you've got to look at the other, the opposition team and the opposition manager and go, well, you know, tactically, he done a job on us twice. And that's the frustration thing. I think, you know, Ange ball to me is all about fast, quick paced passing, one touch passing, five in the box, up the other end, attacking, having shots. We, you know, when you look at it, I'm going to get the blue book out. Sorry, team, but I will get it out. When you when you look at the statistics, you know, we've got our forwards firing. We've got our midfielders back and we're not creating enough chances. Like the first 10 games, 12 games of the season, we were top of the league for touches in the opposition box, top of the league for shots on goal, top of, you know, all, and now that's dropped off. And that's the worry, as, as Rick, as you said, the business end of the season this is when we need to start being top of the league for touches in the box, top of the league, having a shot. I mean, I think that was my biggest frustration is that we weren't, we just don't not have enough shots. Do you see what I'm coming from? So it's not a moan fest. It's just a, it's just a trying to figure it out. Like what, what is Ange thinking, trying to figure it out? Cause he'd be, he'd be walking off that pitch going, we ain't had enough shots here, lads. We ain't had enough shots on target. This is not what we're training for. Surely he'd be thinking that, won't he boys? What's he thinking, yeah. John? What's he thinking at the moment? I think I mentioned to you uh, recently when we were chatting about it, it's like yeah. it's, football is always an arms race, right? Somebody comes mm-hmm. up with an idea, someone comes up with an idea to counter it. I, I liken it to tennis, you know, it was serve volley and then the great returners got in and then suddenly you had to change up your game. But well, we've seen so many things in football when you go back to Saki's with pre- the high pressing game and the, the squeeze and then someone got a way around to counter that. Everyone wanted to play Pep's style and then there's ways around that. So, He's constantly had to evolve his tactics and, and his styles. There just are a few kind of golden rules. We call it his goal, his, his um, non-debatables, right? These are the things that have to happen. 
and it is about playing as a unit. And bizarrely, see when you talk about the like maybe the touches in the box not being enough, everything from everyone I've spoken to him, he would probably turn it around and say it's actually about what they do without the ball. If you don't do the right things without the ball, the other half can't follow. And he, he said that a few times up in Scotland. We had mm. you know a sluggish one nil away or something. And he said, if we don't do that side right, you can't then expect the other side to work because everything's about when you win the ball back and how you win it back, giving yourself the chance to then play quick football. So if you've not won it, but if you're, if you're winning it back in the wrong areas, if you're just forcing a slowdown of play, you're not going to be as good with the ball. He's still got his key things he wants with the ball as well. You know, he, he loves he loves to play with the width, the five lane approach, and one player each five, five lanes. Loads of coaches. He likes his his number eights or tens or whatever you want to call them to get breaking into those inside channels, cutting the ball back, looking for that edge of the box area. And a lot of coaches have the same thing. And the further up coaching ladder you go and all these courses you go on and everything, you'll find out it's just about how you get to that point. Everyone wants to end up with the same thing, a goal. They want to end up with the same thing, a ball from there. And it's about how you get to that point, the movements, the deceptions, the rotations, the things you do. And you're right, by the way, he's he's coming up against brilliant coaches. He's coming up against coaches who are smart and have probably seen some of it before. So he's got to work harder. He's got to be you know, smarter about it. He's got to get his players ingrained into it. But I, th- I think he'll turn it around on the other side, get the out of possession stuff right, and the rest follows. It's interesting, John, because again, I mean, after my views and listeners, you know, Spurs, although they're going through this, what many would describe as a little bit of a sticky patch, you know, the Wolves' defeat was only their second defeat in the past 10 Premier League matches, and Spurs have scored six more goals than at this point last season, and considered just three more whilst gaining two more points and losing two games fewer, which I think if you consider that, John, and I'm going to rewind further back than Lee, that, you know, we had you on here at a point, obviously, where Spurs were unbeaten in those first 10. Um, I don't think anyone could have imagined, John, that was actually going to happen when you consider the summer that Ange walked into, really, with the fact of losing the star man, Harry Kane, and really having to configure a side without Spurs' arguably greatest ever goal scorer. And now I think many are seeing what that guy has gone on to become in Germany and the amount of goals he's racked up. That um, I think that you offered every Spurs fan where we are right now in terms of league position, I think many would have taken it. I don't speak for everyone, but I do feel that the nature of the cup exits, I think I've hit fans quite hard. I think, again, as fans, you know, um, and I've talked about more of, again, I know as a younger generation that, Top four is everything. I think there's the older fans out there. Um, not that I'm trying to age myself too much, that do really want to see Spurs lift a trophy. And I think it's hard when you obviously, of course, have been eliminated from the two possibilities. And of course, what we're now fighting for is to finish in a decent position in the league where they're going to secure some form of European football. I feel that has, I think, a massive effect on the season. So, I mean, on that point, John, do you feel he would have massively learned from the cup exits and will be looking at those ahead of next season? Or do you think at the moment it's just about full focus on the Premier League and where Spurs find themselves? I think, as, as you point out, you know, most fans probably would have taken this, I think, given that mm. you've lost your the, the legend, the talisman, even yes. though things aren't probably working out from at Bayern exactly how he wanted. But he, if, this, if the results had been reversed, if you've gone through this sticky patch at the start and then gone Spot-up. 10 yeah, games... So- You'd have been delighted. The cup thing again. I, I'm with you. I love a cup, so you want you want a cup for your team, right? But if your long term goal is building a team that's going to win the Premier League, everything goes secondary to that. Everything has to go secondary to that. So whatever he did then, he'll probably learn from it and go bollocks. I should have done this. I should have done that. But he's not a great man for second guessing it after the fact either. Still building towards that one thing. That one thing is go go win the Premier League. He's not there this week. And I know this is hard for, for Premier League fans, not, not Spurs fans, but Premier League fans to think of Spurs winning the Premier League. That's just, it just doesn't compute because they're used to Man City winning it and Liverpool. And, you know, it's like, and maybe the team across the city look not too bad at the moment. The other North London, Bob, what were they called again? Gonna go you know, Unison. That, that way, John, that, they ain't won yeah. a title for 20 years. They, they think they have, but they haven't. I won't worry about it. Too much. <laughs> I know. 
yeah. people find it hard, right? So you get the, but again, that, yeah, there's yeah. your your example, isn't it? You get this like a mindset. People just don't get. Ah, they don't win the league. They don't win the league. So it's almost ch- changing that as well. It's, if you've got that goal and you believe this is the way to do it, and I keep coming back to this, this is not some flight of fancy. This is not just because he likes the way the, the team plays football. This is his genuine belief. This is his way to be the best team to bring the biggest success in the most sustained manner. That's what he does. And every coach is like that. They all want, they're all looking for that extra edge. Yeah. Can I flop on that? And I'll let Lee come in as well. Lee's mentioned in the fact, John, that for Lee, he absolutely loves this style of play. And look, I do agree. I think for years we've been craving, uh, craving for a Spurs team to play on the attack because of the nature of the previous managers that we've had. Um, but I think, again, this is not speaking for everyone. Many have, again, alluded to the fact that if you go and look at um, Klopp's first season, Arteta's first season, Guardiola's first season, in comparative to what Ange is doing, Ange is actually ahead of those guys in terms of points per game. And that is, of course, you know, again, acknowledgement to the job he's done and what he's walked into and been able to transform. I think... The question what many are asking at the moment in terms of the style, some are asking it, some are happy to see how it pans out, is that, is it a case, John, where Spurs need to execute plan A better than what they are doing now? Or do you believe, John, given the nature of the league that he's in, it is the Premier League, and when you look at the other clubs that he's managed respectively and where they've been in around the world and the coaches that he's come up against, this is a completely different level. Do you feel there is a need to... I don't know Lee's looking at me here and he won't have this. Is there a need to be adaptive with the tactics or slightly tweak them? Or is it a case that he will be focusing simply on improving that plan A and there isn't a plan B, C or D? I know what he'll do. I mean, he's not going to change it. If you ask it, I mean, like if it was me as a coach, I would change things, but I'm not as good a coach as him. So I would just go, yeah, right. Shit, we're playing City. 4-5-1 play around the corners, let's just make it difficult for them, try and get some set pieces. But he's a, he he has a belief in it. And he always says that. It's, if that's your style as a coach, right? if you are uh, Diego Simeone, and that's your style, stick to that style, right? If, if it, this is the game this weekend, you've got one game and it decides you're going to have a coaching career or not, what are you doing, right? And if your your instinct is to go, I'm going 4-5-1, mate, and I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it tight, that's your coaching style. He's going out to win it. Doesn't matter who he's playing. He's going to go out and play 4-3-3 three, three or some variation on that, and he's going to go try and win it because that's his style. So we know what he's going to do. Whether he should do that, that's the golden question, and that's why we all have opinions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think, think you know, the, the, just to come back on that, I mean, the you know, the whether whether or not it's right or wrong is determined by your success, isn't it? At the end, at the end Absolutely. of the day, and, awesome. and I think yeah. where, I think where Andrew's coming from is not it's not a case of success isn't. It isn't derived by one result or one football match. So success is derived from 38 games across the season or a cup at the end of it or whatever. You know, and, and, and I'll take everyone back to Pep. I think Pep is a, is a good example. He's not copying Pep, as, uh, as some would have said uh, right at the beginning of the season. But I think it's a good example because obviously he's won everything in the game and he's, you know, let's be fair, he's probably the best coach on the planet. You know, Klopp's probably right behind him. You know, you've got an Angelotti floating about, you know, we can, that's another debate, another show. But when you when you think about when Pep came, Pep came to Manchester City, they finished... Seven points behind Tottenham Hotspur, um, uh, Potch's Tottenham Hotspur. Chelsea won the league 90 points, um, uh, sorry, 93 points. Spurs got 86 points, and uh, so it was eight points. And City finished third on 78 points in Pep's first um, season. And I think City had won the league a couple of seasons before that. Joe Hart picked up a, a, a Premier League, a Premier League winning goalkeeper. And he walked into a club and went, no, you're not right, mate, see ya. And just got rid of him because he knew that he could not play the way he wanted to play with Joe Hart. And I think that's the key. I don't think anybody at Tottenham thinks that Ange got rid of Kane at all. And it's a different scenario. But I do think Ange will say at the end of the season, if he hasn't hit where he needed to hit, he replaced the players to get the system that... that playing plan A better than having a plan B. That's what I think that he'll do. I mean, John, any any uh, insight into that? Because that's the man I think that we've got. And I think that's what the man that we need at our football club. You know what I mean? Yeah, his career is marked by 
like large player turnover in that first season in particular. I'm trying to remember the numbers of, I, I should know this, I wrote it, but in that first season at, um, in Japan, I think they went through something like 22 players or 23 players. It was ridiculous oh, yeah. at the end of between over the yeah. course of the season. He turned the whole squad over, didn't he? John? Yeah. And Brisbane is the great example. He went in there and there were a lot of older players, overseas players, okay. big money players. I just chucked them. He was like right out the door. He knew they were incredibly popular, you know, players of the season type thing, huge characters. Some of them went right into the media, started writing columns, slaughtering him when he was going through that difficult phase at the start. But it's about the culture. And he says that when he comes to recruitment. Um, I interviewed one of his, his close pals who works in recruitment, like for blue chip companies all over the world. Um, and he still draws on Ange for um, advice and kind of philosophy on recruitment. And he says, it doesn't matter whether you're recruiting for a chief executive of a bank or your centre forward, culture's first thing. Does he fit the culture? Before ability, before you need everything else. Obviously, you need the ability. Yeah, but yeah. Does he fit the culture? So he'll be, listen, you guys will know more. There's been a couple of players gone out and there might be more to go out. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a, a fairly wholesale change, at least half a dozen in the squad in the yeah. summer, just because yeah. he'll have guys that he wants. He'll have exactly what he wants. He's got very, very specifics. He's working with, on the back of really one transfer window, I suppose, January. The summer was a little bit up in the air and confused. Um, give him another transfer window. And he hates the January transfer window as well. He hates, like a lot of managers. It's just like... It's panic buys and guys who aren't playing and you can't really make impact stuff. So he hates that. So give him another summer. I think you'll see changes. You go everywhere he's gone. Everywhere he's gone. And it's surprisingly, it could be. I'm, I'm with you. I don't think he'd got rid of Harry Kane by any stretch of the imagination. You've got a Harry Kane. Yeah, make it work. He'd have found a way to make it work. Mm. But I mean, it, yeah. But he's gone and, well, you know, we'll, we'll make something else work, you know? I think, again, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it brings back to that point of just, you know, when we sit here and have that discussion, I mean, just how far Spurs have come, really, you know, since his appointment. Because, you know, you talk about that adversity. You have to think Lee mentioned that Chelsea game alone. Um, when you consider the fact Spurs have pretty much, I mean, I looked at their injuries Spurs had since the start of the season, which, um, again, he's, rem you know, again, you look back and you think of Mickey van der Ven out, right, Adogi right. out, Porra out, Madison out, Benson Core out, the out, Richarlison out. You look at the suspensions they've had, Romero, Adogi. Basuma, Kulisevsky, they've had the international references of Son, Saar, Basuma. And I think the one thing, John, that many, many fans, I think, loved during these periods of the absentees is that not once did Ange really at any point use the absence of players as an excuse. It was almost a fact that, you know, you know what, for the players that are still able and fit to play, this is now your chance to prove to me why you should be in the team. And look, I go back to, again, shows that we've had on here, Lee, in the past with Mourinho and with Conte, Nuno, where it would always be the case there'd be more of a focus on those that aren't playing than those that are playing. So I think the one thing that has really been refreshing for Spurs fans is to have somebody that will not accept a drop in standards, will not accept a drop in culture. Is that, again, another thing, John, that from your studies of the man, that really is what enlightens him to fans for that genuine belief, as you said there, they want to win the Premier League. They might not win the Premier League, but they want to try and win it. Yeah, I think so. It's really interesting. His, his relationships with players have always been interesting. And he, he says himself, he made that decision really early on to separate himself from players and not be their pal. Not be. I mean, he's, he's close to them in a different way, but it's almost authoritarian. Was uh, one of his captains described it, and it's, just, it's weird because the player you want a relationship, you crave a relationship, and he was very much. Listen, he's got to be like almost like a, a submarine captain or something. I'm the voice of God. What I say is is the word, and that's how it works. Um, he, like you say, but when, when there were players out, though, he he puts faith in the players, and he he emboldens them. He gives them gives them the belief they can do what they want to do that, that he they can do what he needs them to do right so that's it you're here for a reason you all deserve to be here and when you break according to the players that played with him when he breaks it down he breaks it down in such a simple way 
And I've seen there are players who played in that Celtic team in the first season, which we saw up close here. And you're like, these guys are reasonable players, but probably not going to have a long-term future at Celtic. And he's got them in playing Ange ball, right? Bang, 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 touch. Because it's okay. he's simplified it. Take a touch and play a five-yard pass, right? And he's got them in the right position. And I think that we said this before. I remember Gordon Strachan talking about it once. He said, the higher up football you go, it's just about starting positions. And you get better players, just put them in the right starting positions. Make sure they're they're there. Make sure they get them there and the, the rest takes care of itself. So I don't think he's going to complain about drop-offs. And as, as we discussed before as well, the level of player he's playing with. Nobody at Spurs has talked about Cameron Carter-Vickers going back to Spurs, have they, right? Nobody's mentioned that. He's, he's not good enough. No, for I can tell you we've not heard that rumour yet, John. No, right? It, it's not going to happen. In the, in the what? He's probably, <laughs> he's, probably, he's probably an inch too short or, you know, or he's missing something. He's missing that extra thing you need to play in the Premier League. He's been out for Celtic and Celtic are desperately crying for him to get back and back fit. I think he just came back because he's just back to fitness. He's He's been like a cheat code in Scottish football. So that gives you an idea wow. of the standard. That he's more with. Yeah, I'd yeah. say there's a couple of exceptions. Callum McGregor, I think, is a player who could play anywhere. He's such a super smart player. But the rest of them, he's been working with different. So I think we talked about this before when they were going through transfer, uh, mm-hmm. sorry, injury problems. You're like, yeah, mate, the guy that's second choice right back is probably going to be all right at a club like Spurs, you would think so, you know. And he's brought young players in. He's brought guys in that you didn't think were going to be superstars. And he's made them look like superstars. I just wonder, yeah, John, when Matt David comes David in David there. David. Yeah, yeah. I mean, give us an insight, John, as to how he'll feel the fact that at the moment, uh, not by it, all quarters, don't get me wrong. Again, as I'll mention, I think <laughs> us as a channel here, uh, I'd like to think we're one of the most positive supporters behind and in terms of understanding it is a long-term project. Understanding that, again, when you marry up what we've seen, as I mentioned there, when you look at the start of the reigns of Klopp, Pep Guardiola, uh, Pep Guardiola, Klopp, and of course, Arteta, Spurs are ahead in terms of the project under Ange. And, you know, we mentioned that fact of the opening 10 games, but um, I just wonder how much, John, will he absolutely relish the fact that anybody in the media is even criticising or thinking about critiquing the style of play? Because I think there's one thing that I think has become apparent that in the first 10 games of Ange in the pressers, he was very, very happy, jokey, to some degree. Obviously, it was always on his terms, but... um. There's been no doubt about it that after defeats, and I think that's the great thing with Ange, you know, you can see he's human. It does hurt him that <clears throat> there is that bit of a prickly side to Ange in the post-match presses where you can see he wants to go in there, get it done and over with, doesn't really want to spend too much time in them, that it is hurting him. So how much would he relish the fact that many are even thinking about the fact that this man, it's not right what he's doing, it isn't right the way he's playing football? Yeah, I don't think it, the criticism bothers him too much. He he definitely hates losing. He I'm trying to think what last in his last season here, he had friends travel over from Australia for a weekend. They lost the game and he didn't go out with them. I mean, he literally stayed in. They were they were over and they were supposed to be. Out. His it wife, had, his it wife had to go, his wife had to go out with like the, the guy and his wife, and he was at home. And I'm not going out, mate. Yeah, he he couldn't, he was like. Just like man, that's a terrible person. He said that felt we felt like rotten, but he's like, I can't go out, be terrible company. So he hates losing. Like, oh, listen, find me a, <laughs> a good loser, I'll show you a loser, right? I mean, he's mm, a, yeah. the criticism won't bother him. He's he, he loves the idea of building this little siege thing where he knows things are going to turn around, but he doesn't get too high or too low with it. Is the the actual outside stuff because he can't control that. And he's listen. One of the reasons I wrote the book on him when I got offered it is because he's a grown-up, right? He's in his 50s, closer to 60 than 50. So he's been through all kinds of stuff, right? I mean, from working in a bank to getting the chance to cut his teeth as a coach to going to Japan to having a mad spell in, in the Greek lower leagues, which was as insane as you would expect it to be with a local priest having a view on who should be playing and who shouldn't be playing and, and telling him in no uncertain terms. He's, he's been through, he's lived a life, right? He's lived a life. This is not going to phase him. Uh, yes, it's the biggest and the best, but he's, he's just going to stick to what he does and stick to the way he does it. John, you, you've got so much insight into into Ange, <coughs> man. Uh, like I'm, I'm in love with my, our football club and most people. Uh, you know, when we're singing 
obviously nicked the song from Celtic and, and probably before before that as well. But when we're singing the the Anne song um, at the stadium when the stadium's rocking, there's there's, there's nothing better. It's it's, it's fantastic. Do you, do you think that he can win the league with Tottenham Hotspur? Do you, do you actually think that Ange can lift the Premier League with Spurs? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I had goosebumps then, John. You gave me goosebumps <clears throat> when you said that. It's, it's no guarantees. It is the toughest league in the world, I think, and that, that's right. And we also do, we don't know what's going to happen with City, do we? If they eventually, if their lawyers eventually allow the Premier League to have their investigation into financial fair play. I mean, instead of just True. Pep, Pep, oh, I, I wish this would get done quickly. We'll tell the lawyers, mate, because they're the ones blocking it, right? But you, so you've no idea what's going to happen all there. But I think even with even without a leveling of the playing field there, and City able to buy another nine players, I think, yeah, I think he can. He can, and the most important thing is he'll think he'll believe he can, and he'll have the yeah. players believing he can. Any player that doesn't believe they can will not be there. That's as simple as that. He does. He wants. He needs willing converts. Doesn't want hostages in the dressing room. He needs people that are in there and they believe it. Um, he knows he don't just believe because he says so. Mm. You know, that's why he talks about key games in particular being games where they stuck to the game plan that comes off in difficult circumstances. He's he's more concerned about convincing players that he's on the right track than he is about convincing, you know, fan, even fans as much as he appreciates yeah, fans. Yeah, I was going to ask about the fans. I, yeah. I want yeah, sorry, sorry, carry on and just talk about that. The fans are huge. That. Fans are hugely that. listen, fans are hugely important. He he fell in love with football at South Melbourne Hellas, going with his dad, holding his dad's hand in a place where it was proper old school European crowd, Greek, you know, people you can go there now, you go to South Melbourne games now and you can still hear talking Greek in the clubhouse and you can get a nice souvlaki, really tasty. I can recommend it. Um but it, it was a proper old school, you know, 70s European football type thing. And the Pushkas came over and there was a proper fervor and a proper, you know, real passion for it. So he didn't, it's not like he grew up in a place where it was uh, a stale sort of type of football. He grew up with the fan and the passion. That's what made him want oh, to play. Yeah. That would be close to his dad, play the type of football. That his dad would love. Obviously, he was Jim was the the, the great influence on him in, in everything he's done, but also because he wants that. He wants that noise. He wants that atmosphere. He loves that. You know. You know it's interesting, John. When you look at some of the stats for the season, Spurs are the only Premier League side to both win fifteen points plus from losing positions and <laughs> drop fifteen <laughs> points points from winning positions in the season. I mean, that feels like a Tottenham stat. Um, really. <laughs> Is that is that really an Ange stat, John? Is that what that know. guy does, or do you expect that to almost in the second season at some point calm down? Because I mean, we've had some crazy last minute winners. We've also had some unfortunately crazy last minute goals go against us. Not all of them, I must add, have resulted in defeats, but there's been certainly some crushing ones that result in Spurs not getting points. Yeah, I think any data analyst would tell you that's too small a sample so far, isn't it? You've not you've mm. got to have a couple of seasons under your belt to, before you start establishing a trend on that or causality. However, you yeah. get, you just get this feeling, don't you? It's like two 0 ten minutes to go. But that's not over. Them. Either way, either yeah. way, two 0 down, two 0 This is not over. Nobody's leaving early. I know the traffic can be a bugger, you know, and if you have to catch the little train or the bus, or whatever, it's, mm. it can be really hard to get out of the stadium. Nobody's leaving early because you're like this. Can yeah. Anything can happen here, boys. This is not. This is not done. They would, it's a hope, you would hopefully at one stage have more control. Up, John, you just summed up. You summed up the Brighton game for us in December. <laughs> we were getting absolutely battered. Uh, you know, and, and that, that's fair. I don't think we've been ruined um, at all under Ange. But that game, no, we were no. ruined. Certainly yes. for seven minutes, we were absolutely woeful. Yeah. They were brilliant. Mm -hmm. They were tonking us. And even that game ended up being quite close at the end because we got a goal back and we got another goal back. And all of a sudden you're thinking, hang on. And we were 4 0 down. And you're thinking, hang on, we can draw this. We can get the control. We can this. And, yeah. and that, that's the belief, isn't it, from the hand mm. side that, that, you know, 4 0 down with Conte, we'd have been done. Like everyone would have been gone home. But with that, just like, hang on, something might happen here. So you're absolutely back. We've seen that at, at Spurs already. And then the other side of the coin as well, we've seen at Spurs forever. 
when we're tuning up, pulling up, and you think, hang on a minute. Well, to be fair, that's way before end. But 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 actually, we've seen that as well. And and again, it's that that vulnerability that as as a I don't know that swagger or that vulnerability. I don't know where, how which way you want to say. It. Is it swagger? Or is it vulnerability? A bit of both. Whereby because you keep going to the end. We, you know, we might get a goal, but because you keep going to the end, you might lose one, and and that's the jeopardy, isn't it? Do you see what I mean? Like, but isn't that yeah. football? Yeah, it is a bit. I mean, I don't know where you guys sit in terms of your how much of a tactical view you get from your seats. Are you are you quite near the pitch? Are you quite high up? Um, well, no, I'm I'm south stand <laughs> two five two, so I'm row forty eight in the south. So I'm actually okay, yeah. get quite a good view, but from behind the goal, but I, I do well, get a good, quite that, a good view. Yeah, well, FIFA will sometimes use that as a tactical cam thing, and it is if you're if you're high up, it's it, it can be terrifying if you're a supporter and you're watching the spaces that get left. And I remember being the I watched a fair bit of his old clubs, and then the first time I saw it in person at Celtic, one of the European games, and I found myself doing a double take. They were playing a decent German team as well, and it was like, and he's like, they've gone another one nil up, and they're going, and I'm like. That, that, that can't be. Callum McGregor's covering from there to there, and there. that can't be right. And it was. And it was like, this is the way he was playing. The fullbacks are gone. Yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah. it was like, hey, they're just going to swamp them. They were just going to, you know, go over the top of them. So, and I remember saying to like mates or Spurs fans or, or colleagues down south, and they all said the same thing. Oh, but it'll change for the Premier League. It'll change. And I was like, Man, it is, it's just not going to happen. You, you need seat belts in that stadium. He just because it's just it's going to be like that. It's going to be white knuckle. Now he wants to get to a stage mm. where his team are so good and so dominant and so comfortable in possession that of course two 0 up, you're not in trouble, right? Because you're going to yeah. go and add a third, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or yeah, yeah. Third. But it's yeah. never it's I mean, never going to go two 0 right? Shut up, shot up, boy. Stick on another centre half. You know, mm. uh, play him in midfield, and we'll just uh, knock it corners. That's just not going to happen. And you know, I. Why would you? Why would you do that if you've got a team that's capable of going and playing teams off the park and you're already playing them off the park and you're 2-0 up? Why wouldn't you just go and carry on? Yeah. Okay, you know what's no, interesting no, I, on, on these I, points? I, I I always think, Mac, and we had this, this conversation yesterday, and it's not to try and go off track it completely. We were talking about the Chelsea-Liverpool game in our WhatsApp group. We were saying, you know, the one thing they got Liverpool to win there was the fans. I mean, don't get me wrong, the players did their job, but the fans had that undeniable... Belief, and again, that's experience, of course, of winning. Don't get me wrong; they've won a lot under Klopp. But um, the fans had that genuine belief at the very, very end of that game. They were going to win, and I believe transcended that message onto the group of the players that those youngsters Tottenham. felt that and knew they were going to win. And I just feel at Tottenham, and again, this is no criticism of individual fans because we're part of that. I'm part of that as well. Unfortunately, that culture that we always fear the worst rather than hope. The unexpected can happen and will happen. And I suppose, again, John, it's hard to ask you whether Ange can change the mentality of a football club and its fan base. But I feel like that's almost what Spurs will need to do if they are to get over the line of Ange, because this has not been an Ange thing. This has not been a Conte thing or a Mourinho thing or a Nuno thing or a Martin Yole thing. Or, you know, this has unfortunately been a cycle at Tottenham for the last 20 years. And yeah. culture, isn't it? In our yeah. yeah, yeah. You got a lot of scar, you got a lot of, lot of scar tissue, yes. and that's yeah. that's understandable, yeah. right? So that's not easy. But if you think of, I mean, clubs have done it. I, I, I God, remember when I so going back twenty something years working down south, and Chelsea were trying to make that leap from being the kind of you know when Abramovich had come in, they were trying to make that leap and. They had this culture of like, but we're ch- we don't actually win things. And I remember they went and got, they lost the cup final and uh, mm. chatting to a couple of players afterwards. And I'm like, yeah, we just don't feel we're quite there yet. You know, and it kind of, it took a while to, ch- you got to build that. You can't just, yeah. you know, yeah. you got the freak things, with it. freak things that happen like Leicester is yeah. one off. And that's just capturing lightning in a ball that happens. But that, again, there's a one off. It's never going to last, is it? You know, that was mm. never going to last. So you have to build that culture. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it's you guys know the fan base far better than I do. You, mm. You'll know yourself. You've been through through so much. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It's hard to. It's, yeah, it's, it's easy think, to prepare yeah. yourself for failure because yes. you're used to that. So you kind of build this armor, like, oh, we'll fucking, yeah. we'll mess it up again, won't yeah. we? 
And you know what I think the hard thing is, John, after those <laughs> first 10... And Mac, can you tell me if I'm wrong here? After those first 10 games, we had that one word that kills us, which is hope, because we thought... <laughs> We, th- I think we all thought, you know what, we're on to something special here. Many maybe didn't think that, but don't get me wrong, that I think that's sometimes hard. That I think the reason why some fans feel the way they feel right now is because ultimately we had that ultimate crushing fact that we felt we were there already so early on. And as you alluded to, John, at the very, very start, you know, we're just at the beginning of the band. You know, we haven't really got going yet to a point where the first season really is that you have those players really showcased out there. He's going to make a decision, like you said there, John, that half a dozen or more than that will go in the summer. There'll be a change around in squad. And ultimately, that kind of first season is really seeing where the missing pieces are of the puzzle and then adjusting that for the next summer to be better. And I think, again, Lee, for any time we have that little bit of hope, that belief, um, I feel the fall is greater. I mean... (laughs) Can someone change that? Seven years ago, didn't I? I, yeah. I said it seven years ago. It's the hope that keeps you. It's the yeah. hope that kills you. Like you know, it's, it, that is the reality. What, what I would say about the first ten games, and I think this is where it's really interesting because you know I get carried away, and I think uh, you know, John, you said it on the show already tonight, and and just said it as well. This is what it's all about. It's about getting carried away. Uh, you know, and that's that's my personality. After ten games, I'm the one that's thrown out the banner. Could we? Could we? And everyone's like, yeah, could, you know, and, that, and that, I think that's part of being a football fan. But but to your point earlier in the show, Ange wasn't doing that. Ange was just yeah. Ange, right? And that's what we've got as our manager, and that's who we should be proud of because he knows he he wasn't getting carried away with them ten games, just like he wasn't getting carried away when they had all them injuries, and just like he's not getting carried away now because we lost the Wolves. You know, you said it yourself. That was our first defeat in 2020, uh, 2024 in the league. That's our first defeat in the league. That's our first defeat in six or seven Premier League games, I think, something like that. I mean, at the end of the day, we've only lost two games in our last 10 Premier League games. And we're third in the form table, which actually is quite, quite mental. When you think about that, you think of these juggernauts that are going on at the moment. Villa are brilliant. Arsenal are brilliant, and all I need to say that, but they are. Um, you know, Liverpool, Man City, yet we're third in the form table. <laughs> it's yeah. madness to even think that. So he he's the guy that matters the most because he's the guy that's not getting carried away. He's the one that knows it's not here. Oh, the, here's the form table right, right on Kubrick. Look at the form table. And when we're third in the form table, last Premier League, 10 Premier League games, and obviously, you know, the, uh, the, the team around us have had an extra game now during the weekend, haven't they, Rick? I mean, 20 points. And I, and I, you know, and I know there's people looking at that because it's me as well going. And for the audio uh, viewers on audio, we've got the form table. Man City top 26 points. Liverpool to, uh, 23 points. Spurs a third 20 points. Arsenal 19 points. Villa 17 points. And that's the last 10 Premier League games. And I know that you're you're looking at this because I do this and think, yeah, but if we'd have beaten Wolves, we'd have been on 23. Or you see what I mean? It's like that's where the frustration comes in, doesn't it, Rick? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, again, you know, we mentioned these points here. This is all part of the journey, John, right? It's all part of the process. And I think... It's like that, isn't it? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I mean, again, and I think you made a really good point there, Lee, that at no point, really, was Ange getting carried away. But as John says here, it's his personality to think anything is achievable. So when people are ruling Spurs out of the league and they're within the actual accumulation of points to get there, he was happy to let that play out and allow that to happen because ultimately that's his personality. I mean... John, you know, it's hard because I think when I talk about the culture and the mentality, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, was it in Japan he took over a club that hadn't won for God knows how many years in Yokohama that did go on and do something incredible? I know many, again, will compare the two leagues, but that was a club starved of any success before he walked through the door. Am I right in that? Yeah, he's had a few stories like that. Um, of these. I mean, he, he, the thing that was most remarkable in Japan was... He went in there and didn't have his main weapon, which is language, his stories, his ability to inspire players. Yeah. So he had to find different ways to do it. He had to find different ways to get the message across. And he had to face down an absolute rebellion from players. I mean, I interviewed his translator over there for the book, and he kind of says, you know, it was in the bathhouse one day, which is a kind of an important place in Japanese. It liked the dressing room a little bit different. And they came up to him and they were like, who the F is this guy? He doesn't know anything. He, what is he talking about? And there were even a few on the board were beginning to question, you know? Um, he stuck with it. 
you got to remember, at Celtic, he took over an absolute bin fire. I mean, and I was, it is, it, it tends to go like that at Celtic or Rangers in Scotland. They're, they're on the top and then it just fall, they crash because everything's done short term. Nobody builds for the long term. They have to win the league that year and then next year. And so it crashed. He took over an absolute bin fire there and built it up. You know, he's, he's, he's inherited a lot of bad situations and demotivated players and players who want to get out of the place. And he's dealt with all this before. It's just a bigger stage, harsher spotlight yeah, or a yeah. sharper spotlight. He's very, he's going to be very even tempered about it. Even when he's pissed off, he, he, he makes a, he doesn't get too high after one of the grand final victories with Brisbane, I'm going to say. So they, they won the grand final, but they didn't win the league. But they were champions. That's how it works. And and the players are in there and they, they win the grand final 3 0. And the players are all celebrating. And he goes in and he goes, If you think that was bloody good enough, you're a bunch of frauds. You won the grand final, but you didn't win the league. And then they're all like, Holy shit. And he turns around, like, Just kidding, enjoy yourselves. Like, but they were for like a month, you know, that second they were like, Oh, he means this, right? Because oh, he's he's like, yeah. Oh, like, yeah, forget it, you know. So he kind of he's got his acting standards. He demands everything. He's he's got he, listen. Man management must be ninety percent, ninety ninety five percent. They're all great coaches. Yeah, they all know yeah. you. you think everyone working that Premier League now will, will know their way inside and outside of every tactic you can throw at them, every training session you could do. But it's it's about the man management. Um, and Did by the end of his time at Japan, he got, I mean, the, the, the translator said there were players, you know, really emotional as, as the stories. And there were like three different translators in the room because there was Japanese, Korean, wow. and I think he had somebody from Thailand. And a fourth, and there was a Portuguese as well, uh, or Brazilian, so Portuguese. They had all that. And, they, but, and these guys were getting choked up with his translated stories. <laughs> amazing, amazing. And at Silke, just just on a Celtic journey, when he came into the bin fire, uh, how you eloquently put it, which is brilliant, when he came into the bin fire, correct me if I'm wrong, but that first season they won the title, didn't they? Under that, yeah, 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 they did, yeah. yeah so, yeah. so that, so what? I'm not going to lie because I wear my heart on my sleeve, right? And I am Mr. Optimistic and happy clapper by all the people that hate me and whatever. But the, but. That's the only thing I'm a little bit worried about. I'm not saying that I was expecting them to come in and win the league in the first season. I'm not saying that. But but I, I'm worried that his football philosophy won't stick because we didn't win something. You see what I mean? There's a little element of me here that, you know, and, and, and this is the reason why, team, and everybody, viewers and listeners, right, this is the reason. Antonio Conte came in to an absolute bin fire, uh, to put it as, as you said it before, uh, um, uh, halfway through a season or midway through a season, um, you know, uh, uh, pop, uh, after Nuno. And he dragged us to top four with his passion, with his football, with his counter-attacking style. Yes, we had Harry Kane, Human Son, absolutely on fire, winning the golden boot. But some of the football that we played, and a lot of our fans forget this. They forget that first season that he was there. Some of our football was excellent. It was absolutely excellent. I mean, we're looking at, we're calling it Conte, but it wasn't handball, but we're looking at it thinking, wow, it was amazing. We we actually let in eight goals. I think it was, I did this stat on the last show, I think, or was it in the WhatsApp group? I can't remember. I can't find my, in, in the blue book. I think we let in something like eight goals in 15 games under Conte, and, and, and we scored something like 30 it was it was ridiculous, and you're thinking, "Hang on a minute, this is like a this is a you know a manager that gets done for defensive football." But it wasn't that case at all. And then in this, and and we got something for that. Do you know what I mean? The, the football was embedded. We got something for that. And then the second season was just a complete shit show from start to finish. That said, even at the end of February, John, we were we were third in the league, and it was a free free draw at death. We've sat around his, he I'm went off and one. Yeah, around, his time, around his time now. Yeah, around it was, his time it was now. We, we, were, we were third league. We were like up there still. Um, even though we had all that situation, you know, the deaths and, you know, all, all the unfortunate loss that he had in his personal life and everything that was going on. Um, anyway, it, it was a shit show after that. And my only worry is that I, not necessarily with the players, 
But I think just the very nature of this conversation that we're having tonight with some of the fans, certainly on social media as well. Look, I, I sit in the South Stand. I, I thought the atmosphere, I'm saying, it, I'm saying it on record, I thought the atmosphere against Wolves was absolutely woeful. Uh, we should be embarrassed by our, our, our fans' performance, you know, because it was it was terrible. Um, you know, we even had Wolves fans singing Oh When the Spurs. Like they were singing it to us. That's how bad it was, right? So, you know, it, it was it was a bad it was a bad performance from from the team, but also from 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 the fans as well. But that's the bit that I'm worried about is that because we haven't kind of cemented something this season so far, um, and look, there's still 13 games left, and we might get top four and you know Champions League. But will it stick with with some of the fans? Because if you're not all together. That becomes a problem. And that's what I was trying to allude to earlier about the fans have a part to play. And I think we all need to be together to to to, to win. Do you see where I'm coming from, lads and viewers and listeners? Sorry for long-winded, but I just yeah, there's a little bit of frustration in me that I can't quite articulate what it is. Maybe it's just because we're building. I don't know. I think if you get uh, in lieu of, you know, an actual top four finish, whatever is maybe I don't know if you go if you if you got some signature results or hugely important wins that, that come yeah. that maybe build the belief. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Got derbies, you know, these I, kind of things. That that helped him a yeah. lot in that he ironically it was probably the Chelsea Chelsea lot. <laughs> yeah. Weird. yeah, bizarre. But it be he had, I mean he, he totally had Rangers number in at Celtic. Yeah. And that was the only one that really mattered in that. So yeah. um that that'd be a thing as well. Maybe maybe there will be a series of, you know, you've you've got everyone to play again, haven't you? Still well, John, we've got listen, yeah. we've got Arsenal, we've got Arsenal at home that could go to a huge way, yeah. huge way to decide in Spurs' fate, Arsenal's fate. We've got Anfield, obviously, of course. We've got Stanford yeah. Bridge to Max come. Who knows? Home. Yeah. I, I think John makes a great point there. You know, we're in these last, as you mentioned, Ellie, the last 13, 14 games, we've got some hugely decisive games. And don't get me wrong, Villa away is also gonna be a very it's hugely it's a decisive point, game really in terms of Champions point, yeah. League. So again, there's a real opportunity, I think, to build on that. And I mean it kind of comes very, very nicely to kind of the closing part of the show here, which in terms of, do you feel, John, you know, Spurs have been in and around that kind of top four, top five for most of the season? Do you think given the start we had to the season, John, the 10 unbeaten, the fact Spurs were top, from you as an outsider looking in and again, seeing Angie's body of work over the last however many years, would it be a massive, massive disappointment, John, for the club to not qualify for the Champions League? I think probably people would be disappointed and rightly so, but I I wouldn't say I keep coming back to it. He's not playing for fourth. He's not playing for he's playing to win the league next year or challenge for mm. the league next year and then win the league the year after. He's not playing for that. So I, I he talks a lot about not playing the scoreboard, eh? And not, not watching yeah. the, mm. the clock or playing the scoreboard. Yeah. I think he'd be yeah. saying with this, it's like look, well, who are we playing this weekend? Let's go beat them. And who are we playing next? Let's go beat them as well. And let's just beat everybody. Let's just beat everybody. It's it's great to have. You know, yeah. it's the bull, isn't it? Let's just go down there and beat everybody. Yeah. Let's we'll just beat True. them all. Let's go. True. And then we'll, we'll take it from there. And if that's mm. if that's enough, you, you might lose some games. You might not finish. I think he'd be disappointed because he loves the Champions League. He mm. absolutely loves the Champions League. I mean, the, you know, walking out at the, at the Bernabeu to play Real Madrid, that is like well, just one of his life highlights, never mind career highlights. When you consider, there. John, where he's come from as well, that journey yeah. you spoke about, yeah. that's incredible, yeah. right? It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. And that's why he's such a great story. And it's, it's the reason why, as I said before, when I got the call, said, you want to do this book? I was like, yeah, half a heartbeat later. Yep, I'll do that because he's a great story. It's a great story. And it's got, you know, it ain't finished yet. Definitely ain't finished yet. I think, Macca, isn't it? I mean, that's the kind of, I'd say, fairy tale that you've got a man there in Ange that has built his way up and... When I look at Tottenham, I know not everybody's for the current board, and I think we get that, we understand that because of the nature of yeah. some decisions taken in the last 20 years. But um, one thing you can't say about Tottenham is that they've not tried to do things organically in comparison to the likes of the cities, the Chelsea's. That again, I'll make this point. I've always said it for me that to win with Tottenham for any player, in my opinion, would be much more special than doing it at a city, a Chelsea a Liverpool, an Arsenal, United. You know, that's why I think with Kane, there would have been that clamour for him to stay and win something at Tottenham and have a season under Ranj because, again, what could that have achieved? So, is it a fairy tale league again? When you look at the manager we've got at the moment, you look at the club like Tottenham, 
wouldn't it be incredibly special for this kind of man to be able to change that mentality, not of the club, but of the fans as well, and almost bring us together, whereas John says, what it feels like is the second season is ultimately the real judgment season in terms of really getting to know a bit more about Ange, you know, we know he's not a man. I'm going to come on clo close it on this with John, that he's not a man that stays somewhere for five, six, seven years. So it does feel like a lot will be going into that second season in terms of the players coming in, the players going out, what Spurs are going to do in terms of the way they finish the season in relation to what next season brings Maka. Yeah. I Look, I mean, I think this show has been absolutely perfect. I mean, I think I need to have a show just to get some yeah. stuff off my chest as well because I've been, you know, harboring some of that, that Wolves performance. Oh, been very annoying. Just, I mean, you know, it's I not know, like and, me and, and you get hit by the feet like that for a week. We didn't. Know, we didn't. I, kind of saying, didn't I think this man managed every day. We didn't speak for four days. <laughs> I know. It was the, the Man City result. Like, it really just, I don't know. The one nil defeat in the cup, it just, it showed us how far we've got to go. And it was almost like, for, excuse my language, I know it's after the watershed, but oh, for fuck's sake, like we, we've got a long way to go. Do you know what I mean? Because they really did play us off the park that day. And you could argue it was a foul, whatever, that, that goal. But, you know, I think it's been spits and spurts. And, and kudos to, to Christina, one of our own. She said it from right at the beginning. Like, this is not a free hit, but it's a, this is a working out season. You know, this is Ange to work out what he needs, what he don't need, the culture change. The, the the environment of the club. I mean, we're talking about the Fonz and Happy Days music being played for crying out loud. I, I took my mum, she's 71 years old, to the Brighton game and uh, she was in the South Stand with me and she's like, you know, up and down like a club freed from desire after we scored the late winner. I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up. I mean, it was, it was brilliant. Uh, you know, so I suppose you've got to look at on things like that. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think an achievement for Tottenham would be top five finish. I said at the beginning of the season, before ball was kicked, I said we'd finish in the top five. Um, I got carried away a little bit and said, I think we can finish in the top three. I think that's probably beyond us now when you look at the points that are left. But John makes a really good point. Them defining moments actually haven't happened yet. No. And actually, we've got, we, we've got City, Arsenal, Liverpool, Newcastle, all in a row, John. You probably don't see enough fixtures, but we've got them all in a row in April. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. massive. And I think if we... If and we, Chelsea if we to reschedule Macca as well, I must add. Chelsea, Chelsea to reschedule re as well. You we know the Premier League are going to drop that right in the mixer as well. Of course they will. So it's good. we're going to have five games against properly all of our foes, essentially. You never know. I mean, you know, Harry Redknapp, I think, was defined with the Crouchy goal at the Etihad when we had, we had to beat Arsenal, Chelsea... And Man City to get top four, and we yeah. did it. Let's be fair, yeah. Spurs fans, we did that. And under Harry Redknapp, you know, so we can do it. We have had the, uh, the 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 players to do it. We've got the squad. We've got the manager. So imagine if we did that and ended up, you know, beating them teams and going on an unbelievable run. So yeah, maybe you know, maybe we could do it. But I think top I think five would be an amazing result. Yeah, I think you've you mentioned Liverpool a couple of times. I think that's probably a good analogy for Spurs, where should where Spurs should hope to be. I think there's similarities between Klopp, different personalities, obviously. One's a slightly more extrovert. Um, but it, it's right. that kind of building. Everyone talked about it after the cup finally. Built, building a culture, that's what, that's what won them, that, building the culture. And that's at the heart of what, as you talked about again, organic. If you're building it organically, that's what you do. That's what you do. If, you, if you're a club who wants to build things, you take your guy, you stick him in, you trust them, and you get a guy who's going to build the culture, not just give you a season of success or a season and a half of, of progress. Yeah. You've you got to bring a guy in and go, well, this, we're going to do this. We're going to move in this direction. Yeah. I mean, you I mentioned mean, Liverpool there. Uh, go on. Come just, on. Just, sorry, but just on that, so I think it's a really good point. I think, again, I'm not being pessimistic. John probably thinks I'm some pessimistic Spurs fan. I'm completely <laughs> opposite, by the way. But I just, Is there just any other kind? The <laughs> yeah. It's the last yeah, point. Yeah. But, but we, we've had that 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 whole philosophy in this football club. We had it under Potticino. And some people won't even speak his name now. But, you know, the reality is that we had that under Poch. And Poch talked the same philosophy and the same way that we've got to go for the big prizes. We've got to, we've got to grow organically. It's not something... All them things that Andrew will be saying that you've just said, and it still didn't work. And, and, and I know we got to a Champions League final. And I know that we got to a cup final, uh, League Cup final, two FA Cup semifinals, two title charges 
um, challenges, sorry, but we still didn't get the, you know, the ultimate prize. I mean, I got some unbelievable memories that no one would take away from me. I was in Amsterdam, when, you know, for, for, for the Ajax game. You know, it was absolutely unbelievable. Yes, we didn't win a trophy, but it was unbelievable. So some will say, the sceptics will say, yeah, but we've been there before under Poch and he was saying the same thing and it still didn't work. See where I'm coming from? But what's the alternative? I mean, you know, you don't play for the top prizes. You don't go for it. You don't try and build it again. I mean, unless there's another oil rich state out there wants to buy you and buy the club and, and throw billions at you before financial fair play catches up, maybe you could do it that way. What's the alternative? Yeah, you, you've, mm-hmm. you, Spurs are Spurs. They are where they are. They're an enormous club with wealth generated by the support and the sponsorship and everything. You'll be able to compete for a good quality of player, a top level Champions League quality player. And then are no guarantees but that's why we love football isn't it there's no that's guarantees we love it. yeah you don't you know you could still fall short you could still fall a point short a goal short yeah. on the final day of the season having played the greatest football any of you've ever seen and you can still fall a goal short and that's why we love football because it's not just about playing the football and doing this and you don't get prizes in february and you play the whole season and it's it's that's why we love the game I bring it back to that point. I think I, I said about oh, 15, 20 minutes ago is that I just think with Tottenham to do it organically would be so special with a guy that has had an absolute fairy tale, really, in terms of the managerial journey that he's been on. That when you marry those two together, it would be incredibly special. And again, I think what we've taken, I think, a lot from the conversation with John tonight, as we've known, is that the first season is bedding in, the second season is really where we're going to hopefully see what is really to come. And I think it kind of leads me on to maybe my closing question to you, John, is really um, how long do you personally see Ange staying for? Because I think what we've seen over the course of the season... Rick's some of the paranoid, is that... Rick is totally paranoid about Ange leaving for Liverpool. <laughs> well, I don't think it's even that. I just think, you know, what we have seen, I think really is that um, the fact that he's admitted himself, you know, again... Um, he will go really on his terms. He's never really one that's been bounded to contracts, never really one that's been bounded to security. He's walked out on jobs that have been really fairly comfortable and not really a need yeah. to walk out. So I wonder in your mind, John, you look at the Tottenham project and again, what he's got to really do to change, as we've discussed on this show, the culture, the mentality within the football club, the players. You know, again, you mentioned this point that, you know, it's a part of a journey that he absolutely loves to be on. Um do you have a kind of time in your mind you can see it? Because again, I look at his career and you know it better than mine. He's not normally standing anywhere more than two to three seasons at most. No, I saw one of the comments uh, flash up from one of the viewers and listeners in there saying, though, but he's always moved to something better. So it's not, you know, with the exception, he's, he's walked away from a couple of jobs that just didn't feel right for him. He's always, yeah, he has always done what's right for him. So that's, that's he, he understands that football is a business. Um, I'm pretty sure it was Brisbane where he'd sign guys who were moving from Europe and then he he wandered off to, to Melbourne. You know, it's like, yeah, well, I've got a better offer. He went to Japan, um, you know, with guys having come to Australia. Um, he, he's done the right thing by him. He, it'll, it's hard to say, and guess, because he's, you know, he's not a kid. Um, I think he still fancies going back to Greece at some point. And that's a huge emotional thing. And people have talked about the Greek national team job at some point maybe that's a kind of international football semi-retirement isn't it um i think it will come down to what support he gets from spurs and and whether he gets the the buy-in i don't think there's he's not going to be going crazy and saying you got to get me Haaland and mbappe you know the players that are ungettable but he'll need the support and the the people in place um but he's he's very very good at managing up was managing down he's had that yeah, from the start that. um the guys that played with him even said he was brilliant at changing his language he could be a yobo in the dressing room as a captain and then go and represent the players in the boardroom and uh, put on a shirt and tie and talk to them about serious issues and then be best mates with Ferenc Puskas because they they Puskas spoke Greek um, from his time in Greece, uh, he says he so he could do this, this chameleon thing. So he's very, very good at managing up. And we said at the start, I think that would be one of his keys. When how do you manage Daniel Levy? How do you manage yeah. the board? How do you manage the expectations? And how do you get them to buy into what you want to do and believe in it? Ultimately, we know the Premier League. Like if you're if you have a bad season, you're out, isn't it? I mean, that's yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
If he, he God, if he starts bad next season, he's out. That's just the way the Premier League is, and he'll probably know that. Yeah, you know, I mean that's so you can worry about him leaving, but realistically, the Premier League's just insane. It's got a, a churn and a churn of managers. They'd be wrong to do that, by the way. I'd just like to put it on record now, if they were to get rid of just because of a a flap or a a slight dive in the in results. But you know, I, who knows? Who knows? You know, it's funny. Like, hopefully, Matt, hopefully one I'll thing... be writing. Go on, Joe. Hopefully, hopefully I'll, I'll write a new chapter at the end of this we'll season. It'll be, f- it'll be full of uh, glorious yes, triumph. Mm. We'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Mac, a final one from me to you. And I think Ali Gold, bless him, obviously, massive friend of the show, Ali. He mentioned this in his last video that Spurs are a club that don't and often <laughs> deviate and change at the first sign of a potential concern. How important is it, Mackie, you know, in terms of the show we're doing now with John, the fact that, again, we've got the opportunity to speak to someone that knows Ange really, really well. How much is he on the onus of the fact that it's on the board and the supporters for any concerns or, you know, at the moment that they do stick to the plan? We do oversee it with somebody that does embody the culture of what many fans love about this man. The fact that he has been on a journey, he has worked his way up. As fans, we'd love to see things being done organically. We want to win a certain way. We want to play a certain way. Is this now a time for anything more than just to be behind the man and let him oversee what he does? Because as John will tell us, he's told us this multiple times on this show and on the previous show he's been with us, that wherever he goes, he's got that success. But he has a plan to do it and he needs to oversee that plan in order for it to be successful with Macca. Yeah, look, I mean, I've got personal experience from from a uh, outside of football of of chopping and changing, and it, and it, it doesn't bring you success straight away. I mean, some people in football will say, "Well, Chelsea changed their manager all the time; it didn't make no difference." But they had a Russian oligarch like bankrolling them; it didn't make no difference. So they could just go and literally buy whoever they want, you know. And this isn't a dig at Chelsea, even though I'm not you know, a massive fan of Chelsea clearly uh, at all. But they haven't won a domestic cup now for six seasons. And that just coincides, doesn't it, with the fact that there's no Russian oligarch now bankrolling them, even though they've just spent a billion quid with the new ownership, right? So, so I think it is really important that they stick to the plan, uh, and I think don't change, don't deviate. You know, you've stuck it in your sat nav. Don't go down the, the, you know, the side alley to 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 cut the traffic. Stay with the sat nav. It's going to get you there, and it's going to get you there. Keep to the plan. Stick to the plan. But I think that's really hard. That is really hard to do especially when it's your money going into the football club and it's massive, billions of millions and millions of hundreds of millions of pounds, it's ruthless and you're losing to Wolves or, you know, getting a draw to Brentford or whatever it might be. It's really tough to hold your nerve, but I think you've got to. I, I think um, John mentioned it earlier about Klopp. Klopp's another great example. The 4-1 uh, thrashing that Liverpool took at Wembley from us, from Tottenham Hotspur, uh, when we absolutely smashed them and Lovren had a shocker, their win sliding doors moment. Look what they've gone on to achieve. You know, that you know that Liverpool could have sacked him. They could have got rid of him. They, you know, Fenway Group could have said, do you know what? Uh, Fenway Sports Group, you know what? You're not right for us. The defence is wrong. They were losing to Norwich. Do you remember? They were getting beaten by Norwich and, you know, whatever. And that was their sliding doors moment. They sold their best player in Coutinho and then they went and invested well. You know, they So... I think we have to stick to the plan. This is the plan. I don't think there's anyone on this planet, maybe some of these proper, you know, um, deluded people. But, you know, I, I think that I don't think there's anyone that would sit here or suggest that Ange is not the right man for Tottenham. I mean, they literally fit like a glove, don't they? I mean, you know, am I being, I'm not, I don't mean to be rude to anyone, but they fit like a glove. They need each other. And I think that, at the very first sign of trouble, if it does come, so if it doesn't come, right? But if it does come, the board have to hold their nerve because he is the right man for this job. And, and I'll just finally say, even with Pochettino, and I remember saying this at the time, that was the first time Poch got a run of results that was, weren't very good, right? Let's be fair. It was just after the Champions League final. It was hard to take. And he, he was sacked by October. You know, you know, you, you could have stuck by him. Klopp had a seven-season itch last season, didn't he, or the season before, and they didn't have a great... They stuck with him, and now he's rebuilt a team. Now they're flying, and now he's going out on a high. I think you've got to stick to your guns, in my opinion. 
take a look at Manchester United. That's what chopping and changing gets you. They had no idea what they wanted. And that's not that's not unique in football. But, I mean, you, you when you see clubs looking for a manager, I'm not talking about the odds, which, you know, names get thrown in. But I've known it in the past from experience from speaking to people at football and in clubs. And you go and you're interviewing this guy that get there are four entirely different type of managers. You know, there's no other industry in the world. You know, there's a job description and there's a must have qualities and preferable qualities. They do that. But football just goes, oh, that guy's good. Well, we'll, we'll take him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Ten hikes. Brilliant. Yeah, he'll do it. And it's like, yeah, but he needs control over this and that. And the other. You know, you just you just make dumb decisions if you're chopping and changing all the time. Yeah, no, you know, I, I agree. I totally agree. I've got to say, John, it's always a fascinating view whenever we bring you on. I've got Great. to say, I think, as, as Lee mentioned, I think we've got you on at the perfect right time to give us a real perk-me-up before we do get right into the business stage of the season. And I think, again, you look at that point going into the summer, Chelsea may have a new manager, Manchester United may have a new manager, Liverpool are going to be having a new manager. So you look in there in terms of what is to come for next season, that, as we mentioned, Spurs sticking to the plan, backing Ange, giving him what he needs in terms of that support, in terms of players in and players out, it could be a very exciting... Yeah, people season. laugh at Arsenal. Right? People laugh, laugh at Lego head, right? They laugh at Arsenal and Arteta and everything he's done. They finished eighth and eighth. Like, he won an FA Cup. This is what I was trying to say earlier. Like, Arteta cemented his way with an FA Cup win in his first season. And, and, he, yeah. and he beat Man City and uh, um, Chelsea on the way. So he didn't have it easy. I don't like praising that lockdown the road, but sometimes you've got to. I know they've spent 684 million. Don't even worry about that. So, you know, th these people come out going, oh, it's organic. Like, yeah, they've spanked a lot of money. Don't worry about that. But 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 the reality is, is that he finished eighth, finished eighth, but he got the cup. He's he, he stuck there, finished eighth, finished eighth. And they did stick with him and they stuck with a yeah. the plan. And now they're reaping the reward for that because some of the football they're playing is absolutely ridiculous. And they are flying, and they could go and win the league. I, I don't think they will. I hope they bloody don't. But they could go and win the league, and that's you know that's what they're you know if you think about it, this is Arteta's fourth season in full charge, and he spent a lot of money, got a cup. They need to win the league. I would put the pressure on them. For, obviously, as a Spurs fan, say they need to win. They need to deliver this season. You know, this isn't yeah. a free fall. And just somebody just said it. And just this the Tottenham fan in the comments. This is Ange's pre-season. There's no pressure on Ange. He just needs to go out and embed his team, embed his systematic approach of winning, and we get there. Yeah. Oh man, need a bit of luck as well. Need a bit of luck, Absolutely. and that's it. I mean, yeah. no one would say that Leicester City were the best champions that England have had in the last God. never many years. You know, it's a, yeah. you, can, you get a season where things go wrong elsewhere. Yeah, I go. I was. I'd hate to come back to tennis again. It's always like. Tim Henman was really unlucky not to win a slam. You know that, right? I mean, he just, yeah, he yeah, was just unlucky. Yeah. He ran into Sam Percet. I, you know, the, you look at the guys that won. Him. Pat Rafter was winning them. The guys out there yeah. winning you look during at Murray, that period. Right? If you look at yeah. tennis, John, look at Andy yeah. Murray. Andy Murray, he's won two won slams. 12, but he yeah. could have easily won 12, but he's up against the, yeah. the other big three, which yeah. is impossible. Djokovic so you don't know what's going to happen. Federer, you know? Nadal. Yeah. So new managers next year, here, there, and you know, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, I'll come to the title part of the season. How's that? I tell you what, John. We will keep <laughs> our fingers crossed. We will. Leave John, we're waiting. That's what I'm we're, about. we're waiting now. Yeah. The next chapter. The um, John, <laughs> the book. I say that book is still available right now, of course, on Amazon oh, across yeah. all the best sites. There will be a link in our comments. John, can I just say thank you? You've come on at a time when we needed you, and I'm sure it'll give many Spurs fans that kick. Of a boost that we need for this business to end of the season. John, go thank you so much book, for your time. People. Go buy the book. It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> it is. John, thank you Tremendous so much. Case. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Listen, amazing. And Maka, thank you as always, mate. Busy start again. It's it kicking off back again. Palace to come at the weekend. We'll be coming back later in the week with a preview book for myself from mm -hmm. Lee. For the wonderful John Grisham there, of course, the man behind Angie's book. Get that if you haven't already. Fascinating listen. And a fascinating time to buy, I think, we're where Spurs are right now, of course, as we enter this critical stage of the season. From myself, from Lee, from John, guys, keep safe, keep well. We hope it's giving you the boost you need. And as always, come on, you Spurs.